Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, we're going to be breaking down the Thursday, January 11th slate of college basketball DFS on DraftKings as well as FanDuel. It is a smaller slate this Thursday night. We've got uh, a little bit of Pac-12 after dark action with a lot of the games on this slate coming from um, the late hours East Coast time uh, because the games are being played on the West Coast in the Pac-12. So a um, little interesting slate here with a lot of different game environments, a lot of different types of game environments. So we're going to break it down game by game and tell you what you can expect from each game as well as who from each game needs to be in your lineups on DraftKings as well as FanDuel. Now, as always, if you like what you see here on Mike's Money Picks, please hit the like button on YouTube. Please rate and review the podcast as well. On audio, it really does help me out a lot, and I really do appreciate it. Um, It helps the podcast and the videos get noticed, um, which helps grow the community, and and I really do appreciate that. Um, And also, we're going to be here for the remainder of college basketball season, so I'm probably going to be taking uh, the Friday night slate off because it doesn't look like that's going to be um, a super-duper involved slate. Um, So, you know, with me taking the Friday night slate off, if you would want my thoughts on the Friday night slate, make sure you join the Fantasy Corner Discord. The link is in the description on YouTube as well as the audio feed as well. I'll be sharing my thoughts in there, um, and then hopefully we'll be able to get an episode recorded Friday night for the Saturday slate, because that looks like it could be a big one. All right, so let's go ahead and dive right on into the action with breaking down the first game of the night. All right, so the first game of the night is the Michigan Wolverines heading to College Park to take on the Maryland Terrapins. Um, this is the first of two Big Ten games on the night, and uh, Ken Palm has this one projected to be in favor of the Maryland Terrapins, 71-69. to This is not the best game environment. Maryland tends to play a lot of rock fights like this. Um, their games tend to not see the highest total, so not shocking that this one only checks in with a total of 140, which is not terrible, but it is the second lowest of the night because we do have some particularly juicy game environments here on the slate. Now, for Michigan, we have to talk about the curious case of Doug McDaniel. So, Doug McDaniel is Michigan's starting point guard, and he is suspended for six road games. Not six games, six road games. I don't know what he could have possibly done to get that specific suspension. Like, um, did he get caught doing something he wasn't supposed to be doing on a road trip, like bringing a girl to a hotel room or caught smoking weed. I I don't know. Like there's not really a whole lot of details on it. It could be an academic issue. I I don't know. I'm not going to speculate on that part of it, but here's what I am going to try to speculate on. This is a road game. So this is going to be played without Doug McDaniel. And we're going to get six more of these games where Michigan is going to have to play them without Doug McDaniel. Well, that vacates a lot because Doug McDaniel plays 36 minutes a game. And he also plays this season on a 25% usage rate. So you're going to have to see 36 more minutes out of other guys, as well as 25% usage out of other guys on this Michigan team. Obviously, this has to benefit their other best player, Olivia Nkamwa, who is second on the team in usage on the season, and his average about 32 fantasy points on the season at a salary of $8,100. Like, he could be in line for a big-time shot night without Doug McDaniel there. Also, I think it has to benefit Namari Burnett. He's the other member of the uh, the Michigan backcourt with Doug McDaniel, um, and he has had games this season. We've seen him go off for big games. You know, he had 28 fantasy points against St. John's, 39 against Memphis, um, 31 against Florida, 33 against Penn State. So Namari Burnett could be in line for another big night as well. Now, in terms of trying to figure out where the minutes might go to, um, I think you could see Michigan play big and give more minutes to Terrence Williams at the two spot. Um, with Namari Burnett running the one and Will Shetter running the four um, and Terrace Reed, you know, with his normal duties starting at the five. I think that is a possibility for the lineup you see. But when you look at what Memphis, or I'm sorry, Michigan, I I did that on the college football podcast too. Why do I always want to call Michigan Memphis? I, I, I don't understand that. Anyway, Michigan this season has played just a little bit without Doug McDaniel. Like I said, he averages 36 minutes a game. But all of their favorite lineups without Doug McDaniel have Jalen Llewellyn as the starting, or not as the starting, but as the point guard. So could we see Jalen Llewellyn play point guard for this Michigan team tomorrow night? I think it's a possibility. He was a very highly recruited freshman who came in last season and looked pretty good and then had a season-ending injury and is kind of just working his way back towards relevance. He's been coming off the bench this year for Michigan. Um, I don't know if he will end up being the starting point guard, but that is an incredibly, incredibly interesting value play with Llewellyn at $3,200 if he does, in fact, end up as the starting point guard. So this is one where I'm going to be monitoring Twitter, you know, checking, you know, the beat writers and all that to see if I know or if I can figure out who the Michigan starting lineup is going to be, because if it does end up being Llewellyn, he's going to be the value play of the slate. If not Llewellyn, then I think Burnett and Nkama are in really, really good spots. Now, on the Maryland side, 
This has become a two-man team since they have started conference play. And those two men are Jameer Young and Julian Reese. Jameer Young is the transfer from Charlotte who gets a ton of shots. In his last three games, he's attempted no less than 17 shots in every game. He's put up no less than 33 fantasy points in every game. Julian Reese is the second of that two-man crew. He is their starting center. Um, he has been a little more up and down in terms of the fantasy production, but the ceiling is absolutely there. We have seen him have three games over 48 fantasy points so far, the ceiling. So with all the usage that he's getting in Michigan, not exactly being a terrible matchup for big men, um, I definitely could see Julian Reese having a big night against the Wolverines. Outside of them, like... The two of them combined for a 65% usage rate in their last game, and they scored over half of Maryland's points in that game. So it's really hard to get excited about anybody else from this Maryland team. If you made me pick one, um, Jamie Kaiser Jr. is starting to see his minutes steadily go up. Um, he's playing a little bit more because of the injury to Jahari Long, who is their backup point guard. Um, and so maybe Jamie Kaiser could do a little something, something at $3,800. I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's a great play, but it's just something to monitor going forward because he is a talented freshman. He is a guy they're probably going to look to get more involved as the season goes on. Now, the next game of the night is going to be FAU heading to New Orleans to take on Tulane. Um, this one, Ken Palm has projected to be FAU 86-79. to um, That is a total of 165 points, which puts it as the highest total on the slate. Now, why is that total so high? Well, it's because of Tulane. They rank 17th in the nation in tempo and 210th in the nation in defense. So a lot of possessions plus not a lot of defense as a recipe for a lot of fantasy points. So on FAU, who can we target? Well, unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that the options that you're going to want to target are going to be pretty expensive. John L. Davis has been their leader in usage all season long. He is currently $8,500 on DraftKings. Um, he has been their big-time usage leader since conference play started in particular. And for his current salary, he has hit four times value in five of his last seven games with a ceiling of 54 fantasy points in that double overtime game against Arizona. So I kind of think there's a lot of upside with Davis in a game that's going to get up and down as the team's usage leader. The only downside is you just have to pay a lot of money for him. Now, Vlad Goldine, as well as Elijah Martin, are second and third on the team in usage. They're a little bit inconsistent, though. Um, in the case of Elijah Martin, it's because of the shots he gets. There's some games where he will take, you know, 13 or 14 shots, and then other games where he'll just get, like, eight or nine. Um, and then he doesn't really get you a whole lot outside of scoring. You know, he averages 4.8 rebounds a game, but he doesn't get a whole lot in terms of assists. Um, for Vlad Goldine, it's the minutes to hold him back. You know, he is a seven-footer. He's never going to be a guy who plays all 40 minutes. But the minutes have kind of capped his upside recently. He has played no more than 28 minutes in any of his last eight games. Um, and then he's scored no more than 28 fantasy points in, in – well, let me rephrase. He scored 28 fantasy points in the game that he played 28 minutes, but he has had a ceiling of 37 fantasy points in that span. So um, just – if he were able to play more minutes, I would like him a lot more. But to me, even in a game environment this as good as this one, the lack of minutes is going to cap his upside a little bit. But at least with Golden and Martin, though, you're not paying a premium for him. They're both only $6,600 on DraftKings. Now, the rest of FAU's rotation is kind of a mess. Nick Boyd is back from injury. He's probably their third best guard behind Davis and Martin. But all that has done him coming back is it's just messed with their rotation, and you're still seeing Weatherspoon, Gaffney, and Greenlee play minutes. Just none of them have any kind of consistency. None of them have really been super lucrative fantasy options. So I know the game environment is great, but like you're just playing roulette if you want to play any one of those other four FAU guards, Boyd, Weatherspoon, Gaffney, or Greenlee. So um, I will just pass on that and you can stick with up top with Davis, Goldie, and Martin. Now, if you wanted to play an FAU value, Giancarlo Rosado is the backup center to Vlad Goldine. And if Goldine gets in foul trouble or Goldine can't play more than 20 minutes, then Rosado is going to play those minutes and he would be an interesting pivot play for that reason. Now, Tulane is an interesting team. They play heavy minutes to their starting five, which is incredibly impressive considering the tempo that they play at. Now, what's also more interesting is the way they use Kevin Cross. They are essentially using him as a 6'8 point forward. He is the tallest guy on the team, but he is the one who's bringing the ball up the court, and he currently averages 16.8 points, 8.2 boards, and 5 assists per game. This guy can fill up the stat sheet, y'all. And he has shown a massive ceiling. He had 60 points in a game over this season against Southern and 72 against Furman in a game that went 117 to 110 as the final. So um, incredible upside for Kevin Cross. Yes, he is 
is nine thousand dollars, but this is a game environment that is going to be elite, and he is an option in it that is going to be elite. And I honestly don't exactly know who FAU is going to use to guard him. I don't think they're going to want to put big flag Goldine on him, and I don't think any of FAU's guards are, are big enough and physical enough to guard him. So um, definitely going to be interesting to see how that matchup turns out. Now, the rest of that starting five, you have Colby King, Jaywin Forbes, and Sion James as kind of the off-ball guards. And look, I'll be honest, every time Tulane's been on the slate, I can't get him right. I'll play King, and it's Forbes that goes off. I'll play Forbes, and it's James that goes off. It's it's a really hard situation to get right. If you're a law of averages person, if you're a usage rate truther like I am, um, then Jalen Forbes is the guy you would want to go with. He does have a higher usage and higher shot rate than the other two. Um, the fantasy outputs have not exactly been super consistent, though. Now, Colin Holloway plays the small ball five for them. He is only 6'6", which means on the other side, Vlad Goldin could have a big mismatch if Vlad Goldin is able to stay on the floor because I don't think that uh, Tulane will choose to guard um, Goldin with Kevin Cross as vital to, to the team as he is. So um, I definitely think that this is an interesting little matchup here, a little chess match between how these two teams are constructed with FAU having the four guards and the big, big man, and then Tulane playing their big man at point and playing small after that. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how these two teams choose to you know kind of play that chess match. But Colin Holloway, $6,100, he's shown a lot of upside this season. You know, in that game against Furman, he had 43 fantasy points. So um, definitely buying into playing some of these two and FAU guys here on this slate. Now, after that, there's only two guys that really play any kind of minutes, Greg Glenn and Asher Woods. Um, they, they don't play enough minutes, though, that I think they're significant contributors. You would be relying on one of the starting five getting in foul trouble. Next up is going to be Michigan State taking on Illinois. This one is projected to be Illinois 77 to 71, according to Ken Palm, which makes it the fourth highest game total on the slate at 148. Now, we got to talk about Michigan State because here's what's interesting. They have what is technically a low tempo rating on Ken Palm. They rank 283rd in the nation, but they have played a lot of high total games. In fact, they've played four straight games that have gone over 150. So if they're going to continue to play these high scoring games, I think you can keep targeting in some of these Michigan State guys. And there is no Michigan State guy I want to target more than Tyson Walker. He has an insane usage rate at almost 29%. He has a shot rate of about 35%. And if he's going to get that many shots, he's going to have that much usage, he's going to score a lot of fantasy points. And currently, he's sitting at $8,200. He has been above 34 fantasy points in his last three. We would take that at that salary. So um, definitely in favor of playing Tyson Walker on this slate. Now, A.J. Hogard is kind of the um, second in command on this team, if you will. Um, he also has a high usage rate, 26% on the season. I mean, he's been over 30 fantasy points in four of his last five games. So definitely see some upside with A.J. Hogard as well, especially if this game environment ends up being pretty good. Malik Hall is a guy that you have to consider um, because of his ceiling. Um, he has had you know, two games before the last one um, where he scored 37 and 42 fantasy points. However, in his last game where he was priced up to almost $7,000 on DraftKings, he went for negative one fantasy points. So if you were playing GPPs, you have to consider Malik Hall because of these random ceiling games that he has where they kind of come out of nowhere. Um, but he, there's certainly not a whole lot of safety in playing him, and he does not have the usage rates that Walker or Hogarth do. Honestly, after that, I'm kind of good on the rest of the Michigan State team. Um, after those three, the other pieces that play are either inconsistent in terms of minutes or inconsistent in terms of usage. Um, so I'm kind of good after that top three. On the Illinois side, the Terrence Shannon Jr. suspension has totally changed things for this team. It has opened up a lot of value in DFS. So they have now played three games without Terrence Shannon, and there's no signs of him returning anytime soon. In those three games... Marcus Domask has dominated. If you have just played him in those three games every time, you're getting a pretty solid producer every single time. He's been over 38 fantasy points in all three of those games. He's been over 30% usage in all three of those games. If you think that this game shoots out, play Walker, play Domask on the other side, and just let it run from there. But if you have played, just simply go with the strategy of playing Marcus Domask every night. He has not let you down so far since Terrence Shannon Jr. has gotten suspended. Now, the other guys have also not been disappointments either. Quincy Garrier has been over 28 fantasy points in all three of those games. Coleman Hawkins has been over 28 fantasy points in all three of those games. The downside is I think they're priced a little more appropriately for what they've been doing than Damask. I think Damask actually is objectively a value at only $8,000, whereas Garrier and Hawkins are objectively correctly priced at, at $7,000. I, I think that they're going to you know, they're going to score about 28 to 30 fantasy points. So um, that puts them at about four times value, which is 
okay. Um, it's not exactly what you're looking for out of a ceiling play, though. Now, after that, there's a few value guys that still play a lot of minutes because they have condensed their rotation without Terrence Shannon. Goody, um, Rogers, and Harmon are going to be the other three pieces that actually play. Goody hasn't really shown a ceiling that makes that price tag worthwhile. Ty Rogers has really good usage rates, but they just don't play him a lot of minutes. He's prone to just doing early dumb turnovers or early dumb foul trouble and finding his way on the bench. If he could ever sustain a full game, you could get a good ceiling game like he had at Fairleigh Dickinson, but I'm just, I just don't have any faith in him doing that right now. The guy who's been playing the minutes in place of Rodgers has been Justin Harmon. He was a transfer from Utah Valley where he was a very high usage player, very productive player at Utah Valley. Um, and he's now starting to find his footing with the Illini. He had 29 fancy points against Northwestern, only 13 against Purdue, but you know, that's Purdue. I can forgive him a little bit for that one. Um, so Justin Harmon, is a guy that at only five thousand dollars gives you a little bit of upside, and if he's going to play more minutes than Ty Rogers, you got to feel more inclined to play Justin Harmon over Ty Rogers. Next game and last one for this segment is going to be UCLA taking on Utah. It's been a rough season for UCLA, and um, I think it's going to continue to be rough for them as they had Utah. Ken Palm has this one projected to be Utah seventy-five to sixty-four, which is the second lowest game total of the slate. Um, actually. I stand corrected. That is the lowest game total of the slate, sitting at only 139 points. Um, and in fact, UCLA tends to play these ugly type of games. None of UCLA's last five games have gone over 131 points. That's that's pretty bad because that's a low number. Um, and for UCLA, it's really hard to roster anyone other than Adem Bona or Sebastian Mack. They're their two best players, and they've shown the ability to get there in these ugly game environments that they've been playing. Bona has been over 30 fancy points in four straight with a ceiling of 40. One, and then you have Sebastian Mack, who it just kind of he goes as his shot goes. But in his last game against Cal, where they only scored 56 total points, um, he put up 30 total fantasy points. So those are the two guys that I would be considering because, in all honesty, this is actually a pace up spot for UCLA. This is actually a good game environment from their perspective because Utah actually ranks 63rd in the nation in tempo. So on Utah, who do we target? Well. The bad news for Utah is this. It's been guards that have been how you beat UCLA. We've seen a lot of guards have big-time performances against them, including Jalen Tyson in their last game against Cal. And Utah's highest usage player is their big fella, Brandon Carlson, who's going to be going up against Adam Bona for a lot of the night. Carlson's a great player. We played him a lot over the course of this DFS season. I think it's a pass for me this time, knowing that he's going up against a tough defensive matchup in Adam Bona and knowing that it's guards that have done the damage against the Bruins. So which guard can do the damage? in this game. Well, Gabe Madsen, Roley Worcester, and Davon Smith have all been about a 20% usage rate in conference play. Um, and I think that all three of them are in play. Um, you know, Madsen kind of has been the more scoring dependent one of them. Um, whereas you've got Raleigh Worcester who can really rack up rebounds and assists. And then Davon Smith is kind of the wild card if you've been following us all season long. He is a transfer from Georgia Tech who I've been playing a lot of because he really filled up the stat sheet against or when he was at Georgia Tech. And he had a few games at the start of conference play where he really filled up the stat sheet as well. 21 fancy points against Washington State, 28 against Washington. He's now priced more appropriately at $5,500. But if he ends up getting more minutes, he's a guy that can really give you a big game. I think that the value ceiling is higher on Smith than Madsen or Worcester. The one that I would be more likely to play would probably be Worcester. That's just my opinion. All right, that does it for the first four games. So let's take ourselves a little breather, and then let's break down the last three. All right, so before we break down the last three games, I do want to mention there are some places where you can get more information from me. First off, you can follow me on Twitter, AKX, at Mike's Money Picks. Um, I tweet out DFS Rundown for every college basketball slate where I just break down some of my favorite categorical plays. Um, I'm also more than happy to answer any lineup-based questions that you might have for me. Um, and also, I do make any announcements for the show, any updates for the show available on Twitter, so you can just keep up with us that way. I'm also in the Fantasy Corner Discord. Link is in the description below on YouTube as well as on the audio feed. It's a lot of smart people talking DFS for a lot of different sports. Um, you know, we've got college basketball, NBA, NFL, golf, all covered in there. Um, and so if you're just looking for people to bounce ideas off of, talk strategy, talk plays, or just sweat it out together, it's a lot of fun. And I highly recommend joining if you're looking for more people to talk about DFS with. 
Also, if you want more of my like core plays, if you want to know who's actually going to make my lineups, I do write a full article on Patreon for every college basketball slate where I profile my core plays as well as kind of my lineup strategy and my attack strategy for the slate. I'm not going to sit here and promise that you're just going to win every slate because of those core plays, but I promise that you can get some good sound information to help you build your lineups um, and just kind of build your own strategy off of it. And it can help you in the long run because there's not a lot of people who write about college basketball DFS like I do. And also, if you're looking to try something new this season, head on over to signupexpert.com slash Mike's Picks. We're partnering with Sign Up Expert, and what they do is they give you the best offers and promo codes for any DFS, player prop, or sportsbook site. Um, and if you head over there and use my links, it shows me some support as well. It will even sync to your location and only show you what is available in your state or province. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about these last three games now, starting off with Gonzaga taking on Santa Clara Battle in the West Coast Conference. Um, Ken Palm has this one projected to be Gonzaga 81-74. to 74. With that total being 155 points, this is the second highest game total on the slate. Both of these teams rank in the top 100 in tempo, so this game is likely to get up and down. What's interesting in this game, though, is that you know with the total being so high and you know the spread not being that, that far off, the top four players in this game, in terms of salary, are all on the Gonzaga side. And so I kind of think that some of the Santa Clara guys are going to have to get there too. So, like, um, if you're playing this game, like, I, I would not mind, you know, playing one from the Gonzaga side, one from the Santa Clara side, just because that Santa Clara side is looking awfully cheap and there's a lot of good values over there. But let's break down the Zags first. So, um, the two forwards that play a lot for them are Watson and EK. And EK has been better in conference play than Watson. Uh, you know, EK's sitting right now at a streak of four straight games of over 31 or more fantasy points. He scored over 19 or more real points in all four of those as well. And he's not exactly known as a scorer from his time at Wyoming. Anton Watson has been a little cooler in conference play. However, what is generally the case with these two, though, Watson will play a lot more minutes than EK. EK can get in foul trouble. Um, Watson is the better condition player. Um, so to me, EK is more productive if all else is equal. But in a high tempo up, you know, like pace up game that's going to feature a lot of possessions, I kind of want the guy that's going to be on the floor for more, more of those possessions. And so Anton Watson does become intriguing for that reason. If you, to me, if you think this game gets going up and down, Watson is the more appealing of the two options as opposed to EK. Now, Ryan Nemhard to me, is the obvious stacking partner, and if I'm playing anybody from the Zags, I'm going to play them with Ryan Nemhard. He averages about six assists per game, and his big-time games come when he really fills up the stat sheet in terms of all of the categories. And so um, if he's filling up all those categories, that likely means the game's getting going up and down, and it likely means someone else from Gonzaga is going to be the beneficiary of all those assists. Because of how heavy Gonzaga plays their starting five, I'm not super-duper interested in anybody outside of Watson, EK, or Nemhard. Hickman is the guard who's kind of out there on the floor, but like, I gotta be honest, I think he's a little overpriced for what he's done. Um, you know, he's been very good at the start of conference play, but I would be much more likely to play him if he were even $6,000 as opposed to 6,800 on DraftKings. Now, on the Santa Clara side, there's three guys that have been their guys since the start of conference play, and that is Carlos Marshall Jr., Adama Ball, and then, um, I can't remember his first name, Johnny O'Neill. Um, those have been their three guys since the start of conference play. So those would kind of be the three that I would go with, right? Like they've all shown the ability to get value for their price tag. Like Carlos Marshall Jr. is sitting at only $6,700 and he's had a 47 point ceiling game this season. Um, and, you know, like I said, this is going to be a great game environment. So there's going to be the opportunity for him to get there. Adama Ball has actually been their leader in usage. He's a very versatile player who gets dual eligibility. And he's another guy I think you got to consider from the Santa Clara side. And and then the third of their big three is Johnny O'Neill. He is their big man. He's going to have to stay out of foul trouble against EK and Watson, but if he can, if he can stay on the floor and give you 30 minutes, he's going to put up a lot of fantasy points. Now, outside of those three, the other guys that play a lot are Tilly, Napper, um, and Bryant. I think they're all solid value plays. One thing that's interesting about this slate is like some of the best game environments don't exactly have the best value plays to target, um, and I think that the Santa Clara side might be the one to go with because Tilly, Napper, and Brian are all guys that are going to play a decent amount of minutes at a decent usage rate. And um, I, I think if you're looking to get your value plays from one of the better game environments, those would be the guys that I would fill it with. 
Next up, we got Stanford taking on Oregon State. This one is projected to be Stanford 73-70, to according to Ken Palm. And what's interesting about Stanford is they have radically changed their entire offensive outlook in their last three games. They have turned to a freshman, Kanan Carlisle, to kind of lead the team and be the team's number one offensive guy in the last three games. He had a kind of a dud game against USC, but before that, he had 33 fancy points against UCLA, 46 fancy points against Arizona. Um, and I kind of think that this is going to continue like there's no reason to not think that he's going to continue and I'm hoping that people will be off of him because of that dud game against USC but the secret is is that the usage was actually still there he just wasn't as productive as the previous two so um you know I'll gladly still hop on and buy Kane and Carlisle at, at a salary of only six thousand dollars and he's not my favorite play of the slate but he's got a lot of upside and I definitely think that he's here to stay now, what that has kind of done when he's kind of taken the lead on offense, Jared Bynum has been in more of a secondary role, whereas, you know, at the start of the season, he was a big-time scoring and assisting guy. Um, and you also now see um, Maxime Renaud. I know I butchered that first name. Maxime, is it Maxime? I, I don't know. I, I've never watched a Stanford game with the sound on, um, which, by the way, the quad box on YouTube TV, incredible invention for college basketball because I get to watch four games on one screen every night now. It just means I only get to have the sound on one of them. So usually when Stanford's on the quad box, I don't have the sound on them because that's usually not my priority game. Anyway, that's beside the point. So Ray Nod is $7,000 on DraftKings. He's turned into primarily a peripheral stat type of guy. You're going to need a big scoring night out of him to hit value, and, and I think it's kind of tough with the way their offense is currently set with Kane and Carla. However, Spencer Jones is slightly cheaper. He's shown a little bit more of an ability to be less dependent on scoring. I think he could be um, a little bit more of a um, play than Raynaud, but I, I'm not exactly rushing to play either of those two guys at this point. Andre Stoyakovich is also a guy I think you can play from Stanford. Um, he's just the hot, cold shooter guy. Like, yes, he's the son of that Peja Stoyakovich. Um, so, um, you know, if he gets hot, he's going to give you a good fancy night. If he's not hitting, it's not going to be a good night. I, I think he's a boom bust play at only $4,700. It's not a terrible option. Now, on the Oregon State side, um, there are not a whole lot of pieces that I like. This is a super difficult team to handicap. They are super inconsistent with how they distribute their manage and how they distribute their usage. The one thing that has been consistent for them is Jordan Pope. He is their lead guard. He is their best player, and he's put up fancy points in pretty much every type of game environment that you could ask for. He has shown a ceiling with 40 fancy or 44 fancy points in three games this season, um, and he's shown the ability to get there in poor game environments as well. Not that this one is one, but he's shown an ability to hit value, and, and I don't think he's going to be super highly owned. He's not my favorite guard in the 8K range, but if you're looking for a low-owned, high-priced option, I think he could be it, and this is not a bad spot for him. Tower Bilodeau is probably the second most consistent option that Oregon State has. Um, he's sitting at $6,900 on DraftKings right now, which I think is a little bit overpriced um, because in his last five games, he's had two duds, but he's also had three games over 30. And so I think that he's priced a little bit for his ceiling, not for his floor. But again, there's there's worse options on the slate than Tower Bill, though. And I don't think he's going to be very highly owned. So um, if you're looking for a decent option at low ownership, Tower Bill, though, would be your guy. Now, last game of the night is going to be Arizona State heading to Washington. Um, Ken Palm has this one projected to be Washington 78 to 71. Arizona State has been a drastically different team since getting Adam Miller back from the NCAA's waiver rule, and they have turned into a very balanced team since that has happened. Right now, you have Frankie Collins, Jose Perez, Jemiah Neal, and Adam Miller all averaging over 20% usage in conference play, and really, they're all kind of not even all that close to it. They're all hovering around 22% with Collins being the lead. Um, and so I think you can play all four of those guys because all four of them could go off at any given moment. But to me, in, in this game against Washington, where Washington plays at a pretty fast tempo, this is one of the better game environments of the slate. Um, I would tend to prefer Frankie Collins. Um, he is the guy who's putting up the most peripheral stats out of the group. Um, he has shown the highest ceiling of the group with two games over 44 fantasy points in his last three. Um, and I think that he is probably a, one of the better guard options in the 7K range. And the fact that he's in a pace-up spot and, and recording all those peripheral stats, that's a good spot for Frankie Collins. Jemiah Neal is also another guy who can put up those peripheral stats for you. So he would probably be the other one that I would bump um, with a little bit of a downgrade don't, going to Perez and Miller because they are very shot dependent. I'm not saying that they can't get there because the usage is there and you never really know which one of these guys is going to go off, but they have a narrower pathway to get there because they don't fill up the stat sheet with rebounds and assists like Collins and Neil do. Now, the center position has been a big question mark for this Arizona State team. 
They've kind of been playing Alonzo Gaffney as the small ball five. Sean Phillips was their center at the very start of the season, and I kind of think that that role is eventually going to be his again, but they haven't played him enough for him to kind of take back that role. So if he ever does get back to, you know, playing 20 minutes a game like he did at the start of the season, then he's going to be a solid option. I just don't know when that's going to happen. Now, on the Washington side, their usage is a little more concentrated. You have got right now Keon Brooks as well as Xavier Wheeler um, as their two highest usage players. In fact, both of them have over a 26% usage rate on the season. For a pair of teammates, that's pretty darn high. Keon Brooks is just a, a very solid play. I think he's an elite cash game option at the forward position because he gives you such a high floor. Um, Xavier Wheeler is a guy that is very dependent on game flow. Um, he does much better in games that get up and down as opposed to games to play a slower tempo. He gets a lot of assists, so I would prefer to stack him up with somebody else on Washington like Keon Brooks. I think the two of them as a combo are a very legitimate pairing option and stacking option on this slate. One guy I do think you have to watch out for is um, Frank Kepnang is still injured. I don't think he's going to play in this game, but he does only have a questionable tag. He hasn't been marked out yet. But what you've seen recently is Wilhelm Breidenbach has kind of seized that production um, that Kepnang was leaving behind. He has played over 25 minutes in each of the last three games. He's put up over 24 fantasy points in each of the last three games. I think if Kepnang is out and... I don't see Kepnang playing in this game, if I'm being honest. If, if Kepnang continues to be out, I think Wilhelm Breidenbach is objectively one of the best value plays for both cash games and GPPs at the 5K range at the forward position just because he has shown the ability to consistently get you to five times value for that salary of $5,400. Well, not quite five times value, but he's been well over four times value for that salary in each of his last three games, which have been conference games without Frank Kepnang. So I think he definitely has the ability to get there again. All right, that does it for the Thursday, January 11th college basketball slate. Hopefully we were able to give you guys plenty of information here on this one that can help you build out these lineups. With this slate not being super heavy on superstars, um, I definitely think this is more of a game environment slate where I'm going to be picking and mixing and matching different pieces from different game environments from what I want, as opposed to just trying to jam in a superstar or two and then find the value plays that work from there. So um, if you want to see who I am actually playing, remember, um, we, we, we can chop it up in the Fancy Corner Discord. The link is in the description as well as on the audio feed. The full articles with my core are available on the Patreon, patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks. Also, don't be afraid to reach out to me on Twitter at Mike's Money Picks. So if you like what you saw on this episode, please hit the like button. Please rate and review. Helps me out a ton. I appreciate it. It doesn't go on deaf ears. And hit subscribe. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe to the audio feed because we are going to be here for the rest of college basketball season. But remember, if we're ever not here for a college basketball slate, check us out in the Fantasy Corner Discord. Um, I'll be more than happy to chop it up in there pretty much any day. Even if I don't do a college basketball show, I'm going to be doing my research. I'm going to be building lineups. So I'll be more than happy to talk strategy and talk plays in there as well. All right, so that does it for this episode, y'all. So um, like I said, you hit that subscribe button. You can be notified when new episodes drop. Like all of our weekly NFL playoff content, which I'm hoping to be dropping some tomorrow night, um, as well as all of our college basketball content that comes out weekly and golf content that comes out weekly as well. So um, hopefully it was able to give you guys some good information that's going to help you build some win winning lineups here on this show. Thank you guys for watching and listening to this point. Best of luck to you, and I will see you guys next time.